look at uh, the Lyme epidemic, we look at a prime example of a broken healthcare system. In fact, Lyme may be the thing that is the uh, leading edge for change in healthcare because it is, it is vague, it is complex, it is hurtful, it's poorly diagnosed, and it's also been subject to all the corruption that you read about tonight. All of this is true, this isn't made up. The way in which a society deals with marginalized population is the signature and indelible stamp of that society's character. And the U.S. health system gets an F in this, in this work here, gets an F. Victims of Lyme disease are victimized twice by this illness, first by the unending suffering attached with the illness, and second by a healthcare system that ignores them and sometimes doesn't just ignore them, it, it mocks them, it ridicules them. I was originally told at the very beginning that I had a very deep psychological problem. People called me a uh, hypochondriac. They said I needed to see a psychiatrist. You need to see a psychiatrist. He told me, no, it's not Lyme. Uh, you don't have the rash. Uh, you are depressed. You're faking it. You need to get mental help. You're a teenager. Get up and walk. She doesn't want to go to school. She you knows she's just depressed. You think you're crazy, but I'm not. I know I'm not crazy. This thing screws you up big time. What is happening to the Lyme Nation is similar to what I witnessed at the beginning of the HIV epidemic in the 80s. There was a complacency for that gay disease until finally, just by virtue of the sheer size and horror of the death, the tens of thousands of dying, AIDS became personal and real because it got closer. It got into neighborhoods, into families, and sooner or later everyone was touched. And the same thing is happening with Lyme disease. Who's happy with health care? Not patients. You think doctors are happy? Did, you, did your doctor look happy when you go see your doctor? <laughs> so who benefits? We all know the answer. With AIDS and now with Lyme disease, why does the American healthcare system need a sledgehammer to the temple to wake up? What's wrong with us? How many people have to suffer in plain view? How many people have to die? When we all agree there's nothing more important than health, this is what everybody says. Oh, I got my health. That's important. Then what's the problem? If you've got a treatable illness, you at least try. I'll tell you something. When I was, my dad was a doctor. He was a great man. He wasn't the smartest guy, but he tried. And in the last several years, I've heard this recurrent um, phrase from patients that come from other doctors said, well, I was told they couldn't help me. I just had to go somewhere else. Sorry, I can't help you. Bye. My dad never said that. I never said that. Nobody ever said that until a few years ago. Now you hear it all the time. Oh, I'm sorry, I can't help you. It's not my specialty. It must be something else. I'm sorry, that's it, I can't help you, bye. We never quit on patients, ever, ever. According to the National Coalition of Healthcare, we've reached the point where the public's main domestic concerns, economy, jobs, and healthcare, are really one and the same issue. Arrogance and greed, arrogance and indifference, arrogance and ignorance, the same issues which played key roles in the economic chaos we experience today, are also factors in the decline of the quality of American health care. Where our national uh, health and health of our children are concerned, the American public deserves the truth. From what I can tell, the CDC and the North Carolina Division of Public Health, for example, are now both playing catch up in Lyme for what appears to be deliberate manipulation and suppression of facts having to do with the Lyme epidemic. I excuse Dr. Lee Devlin, for whom I have great respect. She recently resigned. But the rest of you, including the current director, are so busted. <laughs> And let's not overlook the small number of infectious disease doctors who have brought disgrace to that fine organization, the Infectious Disease Society of America. There are 8,000 people in that organization. I'm one of them. They keep saying, well, there are 8,000 people. This is the group uh, think that is, if we all agree, then we're all right. Well, there's only about 15 of them. And they have um, exacerbated this disgrace every time they open their collective mouths to argue against this. They're a huge embarrassment to their society and to the medical profession generally. And for the life of me, I can't understand why they haven't been jettisoned. Because the, the IDSA is taking an unconscionable risk in, in the integrity. They are vilified throughout the world for what they've done in the Lyme area. And, they, and Lyme is one of many, many areas. But they have stood by this position, which is insane. And uh, they're going to lose on this. History, in short order, will show the folly of their views. The McKinsey Global Institute last year stated the U.S. healthcare system had $480 billion in excess compared to Western European counterparts and spends several times as much for administrative costs. 
Recent article in the News Observer in Raleigh uh, shows that Blue Cross Blue Shield North Carolina uh, charged 18 times more for processing claims for the private sector than they did for Medicaid, 18 times. Private health care insurance was never intended to wield the sort of power that we see in today's marketplace. And nowhere is it more pervasive or obvious than when the diagnosis of chronic illness like Lyme. They do it by practicing medicine without a license. They do it through avoidance of accountability, inadequate oversight, through cooking the books, and through their overwhelming financial influence, including, importantly, major political influence on our legislatures. Overhead for Blue Cross Blue Shield North Carolina last year was $1 billion. And I don't remember a single jet plane they built. $1 billion to, to make denial calls and send out paper claims. The private insurers no longer serve their mission as liaison between insurer and patient. Rather, they become brutally intrusive in the physician-patient relationship, rigidly controlling health care decisions on every level. Practice is so pervasive and so accepted that whether medical services are available depends on what insurance says. We've gotten ourselves into an absolutely counterintuitive, ridiculous situation. And they tightly control who they insure through profiling applicants. If you have Lyme disease in North Carolina, which is an oxymoron, I know. <laughs> and, and there are questions on the healthcare application about Lyme disease. So if you apply for health insurance in the state, they'll ask you about Lyme disease. I don't know why, but they do. But if you say you have Lyme disease, guess what? You'll get a quote of four or $5,000 for your premium. But that's a lie, because the real premium is going to be 20 grand, 25 grand, and they're going to attach uh, outrageous riders, making it totally unaffordable, unworkable. And we have evidence for that. I've spent over $100,000 out of pocket. $150,000. $75,000 to $100,000. Physicians need to get their profession back. Patients want their physicians to get it back. We have to kick out the parasites and the predators. Through events like tonight and the passion and dedication of people like yourself, change will happen. I do have some ideas, of course, about where Lyme fits in the big scheme of chronic illness. Um, chronic illness, we only know two of the 20, cause, the cause of the two of the top 20 illnesses in this country, uh, which indicates to me uh, that we're not so smart. We only know the cause of AIDS and helicobacter gastritis. We don't know the cause, cause as uh, Dr. McDonald said, of MS or Parkinson's. or We don't know Crohn's. We don't know rheumatoid arthritis, uh, IBS, et cetera, et cetera. People ask me why I do this, and uh, first of all, I do it because I'm not good at anything else. But more importantly, I love medicine, and um, I feel so privileged to have a place in history in which I've been given the opportunity to be of real help. I love what I do, and um, it's worth it. But you know, the hard part is um, how it's been on my family. I love my wife, and she has suffered through this. Uh, she has been my support. She has never told me to quit. She's told me she might kill me a few times. <laughs> but I'd like my friend Bob to bring my wife Kay up here so that I can recognize her. And uh, you have a guest visit. Look, a surprise. <laughs> These are our children. Love you, honey. You forgive me all right. You have to forgive me in public. <laughs> we gave her 100 roses. That's uh, almost one for every week of misery I put her through. The last week. Good night, everybody. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you so much.